So if uh, there are no questions, let me just, uh, uh, maybe let me just take about five to ten minutes to prepare you for the quiz. The quiz is going to be on Thursday, and it's going to be about half an hour from 10 to 10.30 or so. Please do look at the sample quiz that I have put. Okay? The, this quiz is going to focus on mostly the issues related to array addressing. Okay, so let me just give you a few examples. I create, for example, uh, a matrix. Uh, there is something called a magic matrix. Okay, so if you say magic 3, it creates a 3 by 3 matrix. If you, create, uh, if you say magic 4, it creates a 4 by 4 matrix. This matrix has certain properties. But what I am going to focus on is how do I manipulate elements in that matrix? For example, if I say A 2 comma 3, what would it produce? Okay. So the answer that I would expect you to fill would be 10. When you enter that to MATLAB, it's going to pick up that element, which is in row 2, column 3. And row 2, column 3 is this number, okay, 10. So if I say, for example, A 2 to 3, comma 2 to 3, what would that produce? <coughs> I'm sure you've seen these in 2160, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, <coughs> you just have forgotten probably, but yeah. if you go through that quiz, the sample quiz, you should be able to figure this out. So, this is going to pick second row to third row and second column to third column. So, what would be the size of the matrix? Uh, two, by two. two by two. And what would be the matrix? Uh, seven, six. That is what I expect you to answer. Okay. So, there is a place <laughs> where I say, what, what do you expect? Write your answer. And I expect you to write 11, 10, 7, 6. Okay? So if I do, for example, 3 to 2, comma, 3 to 2, what do you think it will do? <coughs> if it is going to produce an error, you have to say that it's going to produce an error. In this case, is it going to produce an error <coughs> or something else? Okay? It will produce a null. There's nothing in that element as you go from 3 to 2, okay? If I say, for example, 10 to 2, <coughs> sorry, let me just say 10, comma 10, then what do I expect? That produces an error because it doesn't exist, okay? <coughs> so the whole quiz is going to be on problems <coughs> like this. Okay, about 15 questions like this. It shouldn't take more than a minute for each one. And then two problems where I give you a piece of code and ask you to think about what it does or fix it if it has errors. Okay? Does it give you an idea of what? Yeah. Right. This quiz is focused mostly on MATLAB related issues. Now, there are, uh, it, it, it's mostly on manipulating matrices, but there are uh, other basic commands that I expect you to know. Okay, for example, what does sum do, what does uh, index do, things like that. Okay, and taking products of matrices, extracting rows and columns from a matrix, and then taking the product. Uh, so the quiz, sample quiz, will give you a good idea of the range of questions that you can expect. <coughs> okay, any other questions? Okay. All right, so in the last lecture, we looked at <coughs> the solution of the heat transfer problem. Okay, if you recall, I want to build a little bit more on that and then move on to another nonlinear problem in ordinary differential equation. So the focus is on a lumped dynamic model, and particularly the focus is on the use of the function ODE45. Have you used that in 2016? Have you learned how to solve ordinary differential equations in 2016? No. no. Okay. <coughs> so we saw that last class. Let me take you through that one more time and uh, look at variations as we are going along. Uh, remember the three tasks, building the model, building a solution in MATLAB, and analyzing the solution from a process engineering point of view. These are the three goals in this course. And we are going to scan a whole range of models. We know now how to solve a system of linear algebraic equations. We know how to solve a system of nonlinear algebraic equations using F-solve. And uh, the current assignment, assignment number two, is also on modal. 
and it is due next Tuesday. I think we have a week on that. And that will take you through setting up the problem using FSOL, okay? the system of nonlinear algebraic equations. That assignment is based on the same uh, separation process. The next assignment will take you through setting up an ODE, ordinary differential equation solver. Okay? <clears throat> so we saw essentially how to write that function heat and how to use it with ODE 4.5. And we also examined uh, what would happen if I change one of the parameters, the heat transfer coefficient in the problem. So today I'm going to illustrate three issues. The first one is I want to write a program in such a way that it will stop as soon as the temperature of T1 drops below a certain specified value, 90 degrees. I've just picked that as a 90 degrees. So we are learning how to use MATLAB in sophisticated ways to answer specific process-related questions. So the first problem is find the time needed to achieve this. How long does it take to reach 90 degrees? It starts from 200 degrees and it decreases. T1, the molten metal temperature. T2, the crucible temperature, starts at 25. It will increase and then decrease. But I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in the molten metal temperature when it reaches 90 degrees for a given set of uh, specifications. And then uh, we will look at uh, how to program this is also we talked about in the last class, how to program uh, a furnace temperature that controls the ambient temperature in a stepwise fashion in time. Okay? You will see these two kinds of problems. <coughs> Let me ask you, any questions on that problem itself that we saw? Do, do you understand how to develop the model, how to understand whether it is linear or nonlinear, dynamic or steady state? Those things are clear, right? Any questions on that? <coughs> okay. <coughs> So I'm going to hope open up the script file, which offers a solution to the range of problems that we are going to explore. Okay. Now, uh, one of the questions was, how do I prepare my script file in a nice way for handing in as an assignment? As I said, look at the solutions that I have posted. Look at the script files. I've used certain features in MATLAB that I'm going to illustrate today. What is a script file? What is the difference between a script file and a function file? Function has a well-defined structure. It will always start with the function keyword. If you don't see the function keyword on the very first line, it is not a function file. Then it is a script file. Okay? A function file basically programs a function with predefined inputs and predefined outputs and a rule to take those inputs to that output. <clears throat> okay, That's the purpose of a function. Sine is a function. Cosine is a function. Exponential is a function. And we can write our own functions as we saw. Now, ODE 4.5 in MATLAB is a function written by MATLAB people to solve a whole class of ordinary differential equations. Okay, Any number of ordinary differential equations <coughs> will be able to solve and give you the solution to that. We're going to see how to use that for the 2 by 2 system that we have. <coughs> okay. And uh, this is so a script file. Now, the difference between this script file and the ones that we have seen before, I'm going to introduce a new concept, something called cells. MATLAB allows you to define a group of statements, in this case from line 1 to line 10, which is kind of highlighted uh, as a cell. Okay? You can always create a cell by putting two percent signs. That is the indicator that a cell is starting. So if you look carefully, everywhere you'll see the first line of a cell is two percent sign. Remember, a percent sign is a comment. It simply ignores it. Okay, it's not an executable statement. It's a comment. But if you put two percent signs, then it says, okay, this is the beginning of a cell, and the next beginning of the cell will terminate the previous cell. Okay, a cell is nothing but a group of statements that you want to focus on. So when you are developing, particularly in an assignment, you have ten parts. You can very nicely bracket each one into a cell, each part into a cell. That's what I have done in the solution that I have posted that I want you to take a look at. So in this particular case, the first cell basically clears the workspace, sets T-span. If you remember from last lecture, T-span is the span in time where I want to integrate from 0 to, in this case, 10, minute, 10 seconds, 0 to 10 seconds in steps of 0 0.01. Now, if I say, make a statement like this, if you don't understand it, please stop me and say, explain wha what that particular statement is doing. Okay? Don't keep quiet. It will slow me down, but I want to make sure that everybody understands it. 
Okay. <coughs> so, the next statement is T0, which is the initial condition for that particular problem, which says the first element says T1 is at 200 degrees, the second element says T2 is at 25 degrees, the crucible is at 25 degrees. <coughs> and the next line is the actual call. Remember, we talked about the flow of control. So, from the script file, the flow goes to the ODE45 function, taking with it three input arguments. The first one is the name of the function that contains the problem we want to solve. The second one is the span over which we want to integrate in time, in this case from 0 to 10. And the third one is the initial condition for that particular ordinary differential equation. So, it takes these three and integrates it step by step in time and returns to us the time vector in T and the solution in capital T. Capital T will be a solution matrix. The first column will contain T1, the second column will contain T2 because I have two equations. If I have three equations and three unknowns, what would happen? The second one would be a, will contain three columns. The first one would be the solution to the first variable, the second one would be the solution to the second variable, etc. Okay? And then I'm creating the figure and I'm plotting the figure and putting some labels, etc. Any questions on the first cell, contents on the first cell? We have seen this before. We're just uh, going over it one more time. To execute that cell, what you need to do is go to the rightmost, uh, the leftmost, I guess, uh, for you, <coughs> on the top menu. It says evaluate cells. So when you press that, instead of pressing the green button, if you press the green button here, it's going to execute everything in that script file, which is fine. If that's what you want to do, that's fine. So once you have figured out all the parts in an assignment, you may want to actually do that and submit that report. Okay? But there is another way of generating the report also I will show you. But while developing the solution, while debugging it, you'll write a piece of code and put terminate that cell and then execute only that cell. So if I press that, it's going to execute all the contents in that line, in that cell. Okay? And it produces the figure, which is what we saw earlier. Any questions on that, any of those lines and what it does? Cell is a group of statements that you can execute and then stop the execution. So at this point, the execution is stopped at line 10. Now, if I select the second group of cells, I can execute only that part. Okay. So if I press again, execute the cell, what does the second part do? You tell me. You think about it and you tell me. Can you read at the back? It's going to produce a graph of T1 versus T2. Okay, <clears throat> So if I say do that, evaluate that cell, this is the graph that also we saw in the last class. Okay, This is a graph of T1 on the x-axis and T2 on the y-axis. Remember, T1 starts at 200 degrees. T2 at initial time starts at 25 degrees. So this is the starting point. This kind of a graph is called a state space graph where you're plotting how do the states change. Okay, in a states, in a typical chemical plant would be temperatures, pressures, concentrations. Okay, so you can plot all of them. In this particular case, there are only two temperatures. So the trajectory of the state space is going like this. That is, T1 always decreases as time progresses. Remember, time is increasing along this graph. Okay, and so as time increases, T1 always decreases, but T2 Starting from 25 degrees, it increases initially, reaches a maximum value, and then starts to decrease. But if you wait long enough t equal to infinity, both the temperatures reach the ambient temperature 25 degrees. So that is the terminal point. So this kind of a graph is called the state space graph. Okay? So the second cell basically constructed that state space cell for us. <clears throat> now, I want you to observe, if I take this person's sign, what happened? It merges the two cells. So the demarcation of starting of a cell is two percent signs. You must have a two percent sign to say this is a separate cell. Oops. <clears throat> okay. If you just have a uh, one percent sign, it just treats it as a comment and it will continue to execute. Okay. Any questions? Am I going fast? You know, I keep asking this question. And there are a few who are with me and they say, no, then I keep going faster, <laughs> right? Those who are 
quiet is the one that I need to hear from. <laughs> okay? So, <clears throat> if, is everybody okay? The other thing might be that when I'm explaining it, oh, it looks easy, but when you go in front of the computer, <laughs> you get frustrated. <laughs> you don't know what to do. Right? That can only be fixed by spending more time in front of the computer. Yeah? This is a way of just organizing all your stuff. Part A, part B, part C in an assignment, this would be a very good way of organizing it. You can not only print that out, I'll show you the another nice feature. There is a icon here called report. If you press that, it runs the entire thing. If there is a graph that is to be produced, it produces a graph and produces a PDF file in a very nice format of patient. Let's just try that. <coughs> okay, that's a report generation. So it has run through the entire script, all the cells, it generates all the graphs, and then it puts them into a PDF file. So this is a solution to everything that I'm going to do today. Okay, all the questions that we posed. There, there is the report, and these are all hyperlinked. For example, you can just click to go to that part if you want, and it gives you the script, printed script that it executes, and then it produces the result also. Okay. <coughs> so the and if you can want, you can suppress the result as well by putting the semicolon. So these are the time, and then you'll see the temperature, for example. Okay for the first part, and then you will see the graphs. Everything is embedded for you in the right place. So it's a beautiful way of producing the report okay, of uh, whatever you are doing. <coughs> now, by default, it produces in uh, HTML format. How many of you have heard of what an HTML format is? HTML is the language that is used by World Wide Web. Any browser will be able to open that. As a, as a file. But if you want to change it to PDF file for printing, then let me close all these figures. You can go to that report and there is an arrow there, you press that and then edit publish. If you select that, it will allow you to specify the format of the publication. So by default output is HTML, you can select that and oops, output format there. Okay, and you can select PDF. Okay, and then close that. The next time you run the report, it produces a PDF file, a single file with all the scripts, outputs, figures, everything nicely organized. Okay, remember what I know about MATLAB is probably 5%. Okay, so what is important for you is to have the confidence to kind of learn on your own. These things are relatively new. The report generation procedure didn't exist in two versions before. So it's very dynamic, then language keeps evolving, and you need to have the confidence that you can learn about it on your own. And that is my, if I achieve that, I have achieved the goal for this particular course. Okay? <coughs> Any other questions? Yeah? How do you suppress it? How do you suppress what? How do you suppress the output? Oh, if you want to suppress the output, you need to, for example, here I deliberately left the semicolon out. If you put the semicolon in, it's not going to print that out in the report. Yeah. Don't don't be sorry, okay? Please ask. I want you to ask questions. <laughs> okay? So that tells us basically how to set up the problem. And one feature I wanted to show here, this is a very nice feature. For example, if I want to change one of the parameters, the ambient temperature. Instead of 25 degrees, I want to generate the graph if it is 35 degrees or 45 degrees or 55 degrees. Okay? How can you do that? You can go and change that to 35 degrees and run that again, that particular cell. This is a very minor point, but it shows you how to increase the productivity. So in MATLAB, all you have to do is highlight that particular variable. And then if you look carefully here, there is a plus, a number, and a minus. And similarly, there is a number with divide and multiply. Okay. So if I go to that and change that in, say, 20 degrees, I put the number 20, okay? What it's going to do is allow me to increment this value in steps of 20, okay? So for example, I run the cell first. So here is the basic graph, okay? It's going to be difficult for me to show both of them. And then I say plus. It changes the number to 45 by that increment that I have specified and it automatically regenerates that graph for me. 
does it so fast, you need to be very careful in watching how this graph changes as it increments that particular temperature. So this is useful for parametric studies. What would happen if uh, in a feed, in a crude column, for example, the temperature changes or the pressure changes, you have set up a simulation, you want to look at how is the output affected by changes in the input. So you just identify which output you want to change. 85, 105, 125, 145, 165. It regenerates the whole solution for that particular differential equation and plots it. That is, it evaluates that cell for continuously changing one variable at a time. Okay? And you can, of course, subtract it or add it. You can also multiply it or divide it by a factor. For example, I have right now 1.1. So if you multiply this, it's 27.5. And it solves the problem and gives me the graph. Okay? So it's very convenient for parametric studies like that. Any questions? Do you understand the idea behind that? Hmm? Okay. So the next question, I guess, is find the time when T1 reaches 90 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay? Uh, when the temperature decreases for T1, at what time does it reach 90 degrees? It's coming down from 200. It's going to go all the way to 25. Okay. When does it reach 90 degrees? I want to know that okay, as a process engineer. How would I set that up? Okay. Here is a piece of code in the cell that sets up the logic required to answer that particular question. Let's go through that code and make sure that we understand what is happening. So in line 18, what is happening? T0, the initial vector at T. Yeah. Uh, what is the whole function? Line 21, hold on. That basically keeps the graph intact. So suppose I put one curve and I'm coming back with a different solution. I want to put the curve, another curve on the same graph. Hold says, hold that graph on. Don't remove that curve. Otherwise, whenever I create a plot command, it wipes out the previous plot and puts the new plot on there. Okay. So hold is a toggle. You can turn it on and off. And if you put it on, it's going to keep all the graphs. So you can add a series of graphs onto that particular uh, figure that you have. So hold on is to keep the graph, the lines in the graph, uh, from being erased from the next plot command. The next plot command can be subsequently down in the code, or it can be in the loop, where it goes through the loop and then plots it. Okay. Here I need to do. Uh, I need to hold that. I'll tell you why. We'll try. This is a fairly complicated piece of code. Okay. I want to make sure that <clears throat> you understand. That first step is seeing other people's code and figuring out that you can understand it. And if you see enough of them, then you will say, "Okay, I've seen this piece of code. This is how I can solve this kind of a problem." Okay. And typically, there are while loops, there are if loops, there are for loops. If, if you can use these three logic, if you understand the basic logic behind them will be able to solve a variety of problems that one can pose. Okay? So um, the delta t is the time interval. So I want to integrate. Remember, t span has a starting point and an ending point. Okay? So I want to control the increment. Why would I want to control the increment? For example, if I say integrate from 0 to 20, it will integrate and give me the graph, which we have seen before. But by the time I reach 20, the temperature has gone down to? 25. So the actual place where that occurred, um, you might argue with me, let me go this uh, to this graph one more time and execute that. So if I give you the graph and then ask the question, at what time did the temperature reach 90 degrees, you can answer that question, right? How would you do that? You just look at where it is 90 and go and read and come down. So somewhere between 3 and 4 seconds. Okay, 3.6 seconds or whatever, it reached 90 degrees. So that's, as an engineer, that's an acceptable answer. That's a fine way to solve the problem. Okay, But I'm showing you some of the more sophisticated ways in MATLAB that you can narrow down. Okay, You can narrow down uh, when that occurs. So what I'm going to do uh, in setting up this logic, let me talk my, about my plan, and then we will implement it. My plan is to start from time equal to 0 and take a very small step, 0.1 and check whether the temperature has reached 90 degrees. If not, I start from point 0.1, go to point 0.2, and ask if the temperature has reached 
crossed 90 degrees. So I can take small steps like that until it reaches 90 degrees and then I stop. When that condition is satisfied, I stop. I don't need to integrate anymore. That is the basic plan. When you are given a problem, you should have a plan like that. You should develop a plan like that before you can actually code. Okay? So the plan here is to in integrate in small steps and watch every time whether the temperature has fallen below 90 degrees. And when it does, I stop. Okay? Any questions? So it is that logic I'm going to implement in this particular cell. And it illustrates one more application of the while loop. Okay? So T span is going to be from 0 to delta T. Delta T I set as 0.1. Why did I separate them? Now I can go and change delta T to 0.1 or 0.5 or 1, whatever it is. In one place I change, that value is picked up everywhere. Okay? So the T span is 0 to delta T. CLF is a command that clears the figures. And figure 3, I'm creating a new window with figure 3 because I've used 1 and 2 previously. And hold on, says keep that graph because now you will understand why I'm holding it. Okay? I'm integrating from 0 to point 0.1. I put the graph. Next time I come back from point 0.1 to point 0.2. So I want to hold the previous <coughs> graph and add to that as I execute. Okay? Without that, it will give me first from 0 to point 0.1 and then it will erase that. It will give me from point 0.1 to point 0.2. It will erase that, etc. Okay? And then in the axis command, this is probably the, I don't know, you, you might have seen this in 2160 if you're doing plots. Axis command simply sets the range of axes. In the x-axis go from 0 to 5 seconds. In the y-axis go from 20 to 200. Why do I do that? Otherwise, MATLAB automatically rescales the axis every time the range of numbers changes. So here I'm saying use fixed axis and plot the graph in that axis. And this is a difficult command to understand, and it's a feature that in every MATLAB program that you will have. Options. Options sets additional parameters to any program that you are going to use. FSOL has options. We will see later on optimization programs have options. Similarly, ODE 4.5 has options too. These options control how the program functions. For example, without the options, what does it do? It simply takes the name of the function, takes the t-span, and it takes the initial condition, and it produces the result in arrays. But with options, you can say, also plot that result for me. Okay? And that's what I'm saying here. And again, if you look at help for ODE set <coughs> options, you'll find a large help. Okay? And you should be able to read that and decipher that as you need. Right now, all we need is to learn how to generate the plot. So the output function, not don't only output the function in tabular values, but also send that to another function called ODE plot, and in that function, plot both T1 and T2. That's what this particular thing is saying. Additional options, I want ODE 4.5, not only to integrate and return me the values, but I also want it to generate the plot. Okay? There is a nice plugin to the plot routine from inside ODE 4.5, which is particularly useful if you are going to do plots in segments, as we are going to do in this particular one. The next line sets up the basic core of the logic. While T1, the first temperature, is greater than 90, okay, it's greater than 90, continue to do that, what is in the loop. So you need to understand very carefully what is happening in the next line. That 24, line 24 is easy to understand, okay. I'm just setting up the while loop. While T1 is greater than 90, keep integrating. If it falls below 90, stop. That means come out of that while loop. Okay? What are we doing there in line uh, 25? <laughs> I'm making a call to the heat function, integrating T span from 0 to 0 0.1 only, okay, 0 to 0 0.1. Why did I choose a small range? Because I don't want to exceed 90 degrees, okay? I don't want to fall too below that. And then T is my initial temperature, which the, the very first time is going to be 20, 225, and the options which says plot it for me, okay? And it sends the results, I store it in a vector called T and TF, the lowercase t for time and the uppercase TF for the final, the temperature, the arrays that it returns. Okay? And then I say T span equals T span plus delta T. What does that do? It increases both the starting and the end point. 
because t span contains two numbers, 0 to delta t. If I add delta t, it will now contain delta t to 2 delta t. Okay, So the t span is automatically incremented. So when you're using a while loop, you want to increment these variables so that you continuously generate the solution. Okay, And in this statement, what am I doing? Is, but, and the, all the columns in the CF, the length of CF. You are very close. You are very close. I think the right idea. But maybe if we see what happens at that stage, we will understand it better. Okay. So let us set up a breakpoint there to see actually what happens. Okay. So let me. Okay. What are the figures we have so far? Here is a figure. What is this figure? This figure is the one that came from this cell. Can you interpret what this cell says? It's doing for the first step from 0 to point 0.1. It has plotted the curve. So the temperature has come, come from 200 to 195 or something like that. This temperature has shot up from 20 to about 80 in <coughs> point 0.1 seconds. Okay? This is the graph onto which I want to add as I continue to develop the solution. So if I go to the workspace, I've stopped here. Okay, So you can see, actually, what should T-span be? It has changed, incremented from 0.1 to 0.2, as we expected. What does T contain? T contains values from 0 to what will be the largest value in T? You're not following me then, what it does. right? We are integrated from 0 to 0.1. So the largest value in t should be only 0.1. It has integrated up to that point. So if uh, you're not able to see it because it's below that, but if I go to this and uh, type t, it's gone up from 0 to 0 0.1. Okay? And the next thing that we want to look at is what does uh, tf contain? It started at 225, and it's evolving in time. And so tf is actually a matrix. The first column represents the solution to T1. The second column represents solution to T2. But it contains from T equal to 0, time equal to 0, to time equal to 0.1. So the last number in this one, the last row in this one, will be the solution for 0.1. Okay? And that's what I want to extract, because that's going to be my initial condition next time. I think that's basically what you were hinting at. But I'm not pu pulling the entire column. I'm pulling the last row in that matrix. Okay? And uh, I have not done that yet, so T still contains the old values. When I execute this, it will contain the last value from TF. But how would I do that? For example, if I say length, how many of you remember what length does? <coughs> it says that there are 45 entries in that matrix TF. And you can see it here. TF contains 45 by 2. 45 rows and 2 columns. So I need to know only how many rows are there. Okay? So there are 45 rows. And I want to pick the last row from that. Okay? So if I type, for example, TF and GTH of uh, TF. Uh, TF is a variable that I created. This says that the, I shouldn't have called it TF, the solution in that first segment. Okay, I'm going to pick the final value from that to be my initial value for the next time step. Okay, so if I hit return, what should it do? It prints the last section of that solution vector. Yeah. Because every time step that I go from 0 to 0.1 or 0.1 to 0.2, the number of step ODE takes can be different. So it won't be 45 every time. And that is why I'm using the length to find out how many steps it has taken in going from 0 to 0.1. The next time it will be from 0.1 to 0.2, it may take only 20 steps. Okay, Because it is very sharply changing, it takes more steps initially, but it may change. That's a very good question. Why, why do I have to use... Uh, the length there, 
because the length dynamically changes from every time step. Okay? So if you just press TF, it will give you, notice these two numbers, remember that, the last two will be exactly the same. So we have just extracted the last two numbers into the vector T, which is going to be my new initial startup point. Any questions? That basically completes the logic. Okay, so I have integrated from 0 to point 0.1. I have the graph to show that. Okay, here is the graph. And um, I have, at the end of it, I have extracted the time and put it into the same vector t so that that is used again as the initial condition. It's the same vector. This is the place where I will put some errors in a program and say, here is a code. Find out the errors. I might label one as t1, other one as t2, or then it won't work. Okay, So you need to be able to figure out the logic. The reason I store it in the same variable here is that's the one that's going to go in as a new initial guess. But the t span will go from point 0.1 to point 0.2 now, the next time around. Okay, And because this condition was not satisfied, t1 was not less than 90 degrees, it's going to go back. So if I do, for example, continue, so it goes back and checks whether t1 is less than 90 degrees. If not, it added the next part. I don't know whether you could see that. It added the next part. Okay. So if I continue to do that, it will just keep adding all those parts. Do you understand? Any questions? Can I remove this and then say go finish all the job? Then it will continue to do this integration until the temperature drops below 90 degrees. Of course, it did all the other part, but I need only that part. Where is that graph? I guess it erased that graph because I didn't place the hold. See, these bugs occur all the time, so let me just run this cell alone. There you see. Okay, it came up to 90 degrees, and when it reached below 90 degrees, it stopped. Okay, so I know now it is about 3.5 or 3.6. If I want to know the exact value, how would I do that? Print the, the last value of time, for example, 3.7. So somewhere between 3.69 and 3.7, I guess it's switched to, uh, went below 90 degrees. Okay, So you can refine these logic. And uh, those who are strong in MATLAB, I would encourage you to go and make it even better. And for those who are frustrated with MATLAB, study these examples. The more time you spend playing with it and studying it, it's like learning a new language. You will you will get it. Okay, uh, it's actually better than learning a new natural language because it's more precise in some sense. Any questions? Yeah. Yeah. The options is the more difficult part in here because what I'm doing is I am not using an explicit plot command as I did in the previous part. There is an option in ODE 4.5 to send the output directly to a plot so that the plot is automatically generated as it is integrating. Otherwise, I need to finish the integration, get the data out, and then plot. That's what I did in the previous cell. If you look at the previous cells, I finished the integration. I didn't have options there, right? So I finished the integration. I got the two solutions, and then I'm using my own plot command to plot. Okay, so in this one, because ODE 4.5 has that option, I'm setting that option in here to say, take the output function and send it to ODE plot. ODE plot is a function. Its job is to take the data from the integrator and plot it out automatically for us. Okay, and then you want you can select because if you have ten equations, it's going to plot all the ten variables as a function of time. You can select no plot only the first and the fifth, for example. And that's what you specify in the next argument. Output select is a keyword, and I'm saying select both 1 and 2, plot both T1 and T2. Now, to learn more about this, all you need to do is go to this and ask for help ODE set. Okay, so ODE set is a function, and it gives you all the parameters that you can set. It's a huge one. Okay, so you will learn as you keep using this options feature in many programs, you will learn 
what they mean. The general structure is fairly uniform in every program. Say, so for example, options equals ODE set, name one, its value, name two, its value. So it's some name, some keyword, and what is the value for that? A keyword, and what is the value for that? You alternate like that. Okay? And the, they explain what the keywords that are available. For example, you can control the error, relative tolerance, absolute tolerance. We will learn what these are when you look at the algorithms themselves later on. Okay? Um, this is the one that we needed, output function. So installable output function. So this says, take the output and send it to another function. In this particular case, it's ODE plot. And its purpose is to generate the graph for us. Okay? And yeah. It is it is a variable. It is a variable. That's a very good question. That's a pretty very advanced question, in fact. Because what we can pass to a function is only variables or function names, pointers to function names. So here at that is a pointer to a function name. But this one is a variable. Now, options is actually turns out to be something called a structured variable. Okay, so <coughs> it is defined. So, if you are curious, and this I would encourage all all who are comfortable in MATLAB, if you want to learn more about it, there is a variable called options here. We have created that variable. Okay, so it is a variable, and if you click on that, it tells you it's called a structured variable. So, it has many substructures that are specified. In our case, we specified only the output function, the output selection, which variable we want to select. But there are a number of others. Okay. So, for example, any variable in MATLAB window, you can type and look at its value, right? So, you can do the same thing to options. You can see type options, and it says, okay, these are the current values for options. Most of them are blank now because I haven't specified them. The only two I specified is the substructure within options. Output function and output selection. Does that make sense to you? Do you understand the idea? How many of you have seen structures in, in 2160? MATLAB, in that sense, is really a very powerful language because it has borrowed a lot of uh, ideas from C language, from C++, object-oriented programming, etc. And the structured variable is one. And this is uh, options is a structured variable. <coughs> For example, options equals, when it says abs tall, is nothing, nothing is defined. To access only that part of the structure, you could type options, options dot abs tall, the second part of that keyword, okay? So it's nothing. For example, uh, uh, options um, out put <coughs> FCN. That's Again, another part of the same structured variable options says so ODE plot. Okay, so it takes all those and sends it to ODE 45, and ODE 45 examines all of them and says, okay, among the options, this guy wants only the plot, and he wants only to plot one and two. It executes that. Okay. So some of these questions may seem kind of too much for those who are struggling with MATLAB, but at least you get exposed to it. So one of the purposes is to show what is possible. Okay. And then you can learn on your own, climb as much as you can. But there is a minimum threshold that I said to pass the course, of course, that you must meet. Okay? But you should, those who can, should go beyond and learn. If there are no questions, any more questions? Let me move on to the next section, which I think we did before <coughs> in the last lecture. The, 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 the objective, the process question was, it cools very fast. It cools in 10 seconds, 15 seconds. I want to control the temperature so that, for example, molten metal, the structure, the crystalline structure would depend on heat treatment. Okay? So you want to control the rate of cooling. How can I achieve that? And one of the ways that we saw was to change, actually, the heating environment, that is the heat transfer environment. I can put a fan and heat it, uh, cool it much faster. I can take away the fan, I can cool it slower. So when I have the fan or not have the fan, it affects the H2, the heat transfer coefficient from the crucible to the environment in the mathematical model that we developed. So the question is, how can I change H2 and see what it does to the heating rate or the cooling rate? Okay, And that is the logic. The logic I'm going to do is I'm going to set up several values for H2, the heat transfer coefficient, 
and solve the problem in a loop for each value of that and then plot the graph. So once again, that segment of the uh, script, clear the figure, create a new figure 4 and put a hold on it. And this is the key, okay, H2 list. So I'm creating a list of variables and I'm putting the values 1.6.2.05. So I have four cases for H2, the heat transfer coefficient. For each case, I want to solve the problem, plot the cooling temperature curve, okay, to see how it looks. <coughs> and I think we saw this in the last class. The color variable simply sets a character variable with four numbers, four characters, B, G, R, C, blue, green, red, cyan, for example. These are the colors that I'm going to use to plot the various graphs for each value of H2. Okay, so the next one is where I set up the loop to calculate the problem for four different values of H2, okay? So here I say for I equal to length of H2 list. Why did I use length of H2 list? I could have put four, right? It would have worked. That's perfectly fine. If you're happy with that, you put a four there, that's fine. Now, I want to, for example, put a number 0 0.01. What have I done? I have expanded my list. And I want the loop to work automatically for any number of variables in that list. Okay? And that's the reason I put <coughs> <coughs> the length, okay? length of H2 list. I'm going to deliberately introduce an error. I want to see whether you can capture it. Okay? So the next line simply says, take the value from the H2 list when I equal to 1. For example, take the first value, put it into the variable H2. H2 is the one that is going to go to the function that I have written, heat. Okay, remember if you open the function heat, uh, I guess I should open this one. <coughs> okay, so if you look at this function, it's basically the same function that we wrote before, except I've gotten rid of H2. I have H1, but I've gotten rid of H2. But I've declared H2 as a global variable. What is the idea behind global variable? you can pass the value from the main program into a function, okay? So in this case, I'm going to pass it from the script into this function, uh, <coughs> which will use different values of H2. So I gain an ability to change H2 from outside. Of course, I could have done this. I could have said uh, H2 equals 2, for example. And then I come back and solve and say H2 equal to 3. That's possible, okay? But a more easy way in terms of scanning a whole range of parameters instead of changing every time in this function <coughs> is to do what I'm doing, which is to pass through the global variable. And you also learn how to use the global variable in the process. Okay? So the value of H2 here is not defined in, inside this function. It's going to be picked up. The best way to look up this, H2 is a variable, right? It's a variable in the workspace. It's like a mailbox that you have. You put numbers, any numbers, and anybody can come and pick that number and do whatever they want with it. The same idea. So this function uh, can go to that particular location, get its value. Okay. <coughs> so H2 list is not available inside that function heat. Only H2 is available because only H2 has been declared as global in this line. Okay. And then the same program that I have, initial temperature, the span, I'm going in span all the way from 0 to 50. And I'm not using options here. So heat H2. I change the name of the function because this function has to get the value of H2 through a global. So I just change the function name and put it into a separate file. And T span T0. And then plot. Okay. Any questions on that particular script? Yeah. 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 I can put that hold on. It is it doesn't create any problem in this particular case. The reason is it's outside of the loop. It's going to be executed only once. So when you say hold, it's going to turn flip. If you say hold by itself, if it is off, it turns it on. If it is on, it turns it off. Okay. Whereas uh, in the previous case, it was inside the loop. And if I put only hold, every time it goes through the loop, it will flip it on and off, on and off, on and off. Okay. <coughs> it's a good good observation. So, how do I execute this cell? Let me just try that. Now, what do I have here? Okay. 
I have a graph in blue. The first line is blue. So that corresponds to h equal to 1. I have a second graph that is in green. The second graph is green. That corresponds to h equals 0.6. Okay. So each graph is color coded in that way. I can decipher. And what you see is as I decrease h, the time it takes for the two temperatures to come together gets longer and longer. The blue curves merge around 20 seconds. The cyan curves haven't merged yet, even after 50 seconds. Okay? So I can prolong the cooling, uh, slow down the cooling rate, keep it warm for a longer period of time if I can control the ambient environment, its heat transfer coefficient. Okay? <coughs> That's the physics behind this particular illustration. Any questions on the graph? It was generated by going through the loop for as many times as I have values in there. Okay? Question? Oh, yeah, I was just about to ask. Because you didn't have another uh, color for 0.01, it wasn't going to. I'm surprised too. How come it didn't do that? One, two, three. It did only four. I expected five, right? I see blue, green, red, and cyan. I have only four colors. I'm going through the loop five times. Okay? So for the fifth time, it didn't generate the plot, so probably it generated an error message in my workspace. Let's see that. There it is. Okay? That's what I wanted to pick up. I deliberately said I'm going to introduce an error and see who can pick it up. Okay? So I expected <laughs> five graphs. I didn't get the five graphs. The reason is it failed when it came into executing this line the fifth time around because it's asking for color 5. I didn't have a color 5. Okay? But I can go back and increase that. For example, put another blue there. Save that and execute that. Now I get like that. <coughs> okay? Any questions on that? Am I going fast? Or are you guys okay? All right. The, the last step is um, <coughs> so th this one, okay, let me ask you the other way. What does this piece of code do? To answer the same question, I said it's an alternate way to change H2. <coughs> I've still declared H2 as a global variable. Okay, I've put a value of 0.2. How can I change the value to different values and get the graph added? By using, by using an increment. Okay, so just an alternate way. So if I say 0.1, for example, <coughs> 0 0.1, okay, then I can execute this and I get the graph, but I get the graph only for 0.1, right? So all I need to do is do the plus. What happened? I need to highlight that value. Okay, that way it knows that it is that value that I'm incrementing. Okay, and then plus that 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5, or decrement that. Okay, so there are a number of different ways of doing the same thing in MATLAB to answer your specific process related question. That's the point. <coughs> okay, any questions? Okay, the last variation in this problem that I want to do is how to program the environment not by controlling the heat transfer coefficient, by controlling the ambient temperature, room temperature. So if I put the crucible on the table, it's room temperature 25 degrees, it has a certain cooling rate. But if I take the same crucible and put it into a furnace, and I can control the temperature of the furnace to be 50 degrees or 100 degrees or whatever I want, then I can also control the <coughs> uh, cooling rate. But in particular, what I want to do, this you will find very useful when you go to the process control course. Process control course uses a lot of MATLAB. Okay? Um, what you will find is you can interface MATLAB with uh, control elements, actually. So with a furnace, you can hook it up to a furnace and you can send signals, which says at 10 seconds, keep the temperature, till 10 seconds, keep the temperature at 100 degrees in the furnace. From 10 seconds to 50 seconds, for example, reduce it to 50 degrees. From 50 seconds to onwards, you reduce it to 25 degrees. This is programmed control of how the temperature of the ambient condition should be changed in the model.
Okay. <coughs> so that is the problem. The problem is how to control t infinity as a function of time. If you go back to the, do I have the differential equation? Yes, I don't have the differential equation. Let me go back to the previous lecture. I want you to see the model equation so that you understand what it is that we are trying to do. So let me open up the last lecture. where you will find those equations. Okay? These are the equations we are solving. Okay? We have learned so far how to change H2. In this particular section, we are going to change T infinity. We are not only going to change it, T infinity, we are going to make T infinity as a function of time. Okay? That means at different times, a step change. At different times, we are going to program it such that the temperature keeps changing. <coughs> What allows us to do that is the nature of the problem. It is an ordinary differential equation. Things are evolving with time. And now you will understand a feature that we have not used at all so far in the function. Okay, if you look at the heat function, if you remember, the first variable here was time. And it actually says the time was never used inside that function. Okay, now we can say we can use that function. If the time is 10 seconds, change to infinity. If the time is 20 seconds, change the infinity to a different value. Okay? That's, that's where the hook is, that we can get the value of the time inside this function and make conditional changes to t infinity. Instead of keeping t infinity as a constant, change conditional changes to t infinity, depending on the time. How do we do that? If I give you that problem right now, how many of you feel comfortable you can go and write, change that piece of code to implement that idea? That's good. If you can do that, that means you're confident enough to go and try it. Okay. <clears throat> do you understand the problem, everybody? What we want to do is we want to change the temperature infinity, T infinity, as a function of time in a particular programmed way. And the programmed way is it has to be 100, 50, and 25 degrees. The times are 10 seconds, 50 seconds, and 100 seconds, for example. Okay. <clears throat> Let me show you the code again for that. Um, where is that piece of code that I am trying to implement? This is the same heat function. Okay, it has the same values of h1, h2, a1, a2, etc. T infinity is no longer constant. Which lines implement the idea that I wanted to force? <coughs> it, uh, it actually starts at line 15 all the way up to line 21. There is a logic that I have included where t infinity was before. I got rid of the t infinity equals 25 degrees. Instead of that, I inserted this code. Let's understand what this code does. If t, the time that comes from this variable as an input, Okay, ODE45 will send it all the time. This is the current time. This is the current temperature. Give me the functions. The functions are the slopes. Then I can predict what is the temperature at the next time step. So they communicate. ODE45 and this function communicate. So it will send the value of T. So if T is less than 20 degrees, T infinity is equal to T infinity program 1. So what I'm doing is I'm passing once again a global variable, and I call it as T infinity underscore program. This is a programmed temperature control. Okay? So if you go to the other function, you will find T infinity program is defined as a global. So the values are going to be passed. And I'm putting three values here, 100, 50, and 25. So I want the temperature to go down from 100 to 50 to 25 in three stages. Okay? And inside this function, if T is less than 20, <coughs> take the first value. So t infinity is going to be what? 100. Else, if t is greater than 20 and t is less than 40 for the next 20 seconds, okay, if t satisfies that condition, t infinity is take the second value, which is 50 degrees. Else, all other conditions, whatever the time is, if it is not satisfied in the first two conditions, it means it must be greater than 40. Okay? Then pick the third value. That's all I need to do. Yeah. Uh, why do we use two and signs for the <coughs> statement? 
<laughs> that is the syntax of MATLAB. You need to have two AND signs to use an AND. If you have only AND, one AND sign, it means different or something else, which escapes my mind. I cannot explain what it is. But you can always go back and ask, what is help AND? Oops. Okay, so it puts out a lot of information. So these are all the operators that you should be familiar with. I'm sure you've seen this in 2060, right? Less than or equal to, for example, equal to has two equal signs. Okay, why is it different from one equal sign? Assigns a variable. One equal sign assigns a variable. A equals 5 will assign it. Whereas A equal equal 5 will check whether A is actually equal to 5 and return a logical variable, whether it is true or false. Okay, <clears throat> so uh, not equal to, less than, less than or equal to, and uh, <coughs> and sign. See, there are two two ones. Element wise, logical and. That's what one amper sign is. Okay, element wise, it compares. Okay, whereas two and uh, is a short circuit logical. I don't know what that means actually, but it gets it gets the job done. Right? It compares. Uh, it, it executes the first. And it executes the second. If both are true, then it will execute that. <coughs> okay. Um, so let's just run that program and see what kind of a result it produces. So once again, I'm going to execute only that cell. That's the output. Okay. So at 20 seconds, I drop the temperature from 100 degrees to 50 degrees. So Till that time, I was keeping the crucible at 100 degrees, the molten metal at 200 degrees. So <clears throat> the crucible from 100 degrees actually increased to about 150 degrees. And then both of them started decreasing. Okay? And they almost reached the same temperature at 100 degrees. <coughs> and if I had continued this T for longer, what would have happened? For example, what I'm saying is, in this, instead of saying 20, I say do 50. And I change this to 50, and I change that to 100. What do you think would happen? So for the first 50 seconds, it's going to keep it, yeah? They will converge, and once they both reach 100 degrees, it's going to remain flat at 100 degrees. And then when I drop it further, it's going to drop, okay? That's very good. Very good. Uh, you're going to be a good engineer, physical intuition of what's going to happen, okay? So let's just execute that. <coughs> what did I do wrong? <laughs> I need to expand the graph axis. But as he predicted, it remains constant 100 degrees for a long time because the ambient temperature itself is 100 degrees. It cannot cool further. Okay, So I need to go and uh, change the axis. Okay, So I can, for example, put a command here, axis 0, 200, and 25 to 200, 25. So this simply says the first two numbers refers to x-axis range, the second two numbers refer to y-axis range. So I can, oops. <coughs> what is an invalid statement there? I need to put a parenthesis there. I forgot to put that. <laughs> okay. What's happening? <laughs> it's still producing only up to. Yeah, T span, T span. Let me change that to 500. Thank you. That's what you were trying to tell me. There it is. Okay. <clears throat> so it goes, it remains constant once they both equilibrate at 100 degrees until I drop it again. Okay. And they both come together down. In the previous case, it was starting at 25 degrees, so it was shooting up and then coming down. Okay. So it gives you an ability to answer process type questions in a MATLAB environment, understanding the fundamental model, model development, and then understanding the model response. <coughs> okay, any questions? Yeah. I just um, when you start a new cell, you have guessing it's going to combine. Good, good question. Good, it's a very also a very perceptive question. What happens when I'm executing only one part of the cell? Okay, that's what you're asking in a sense. So I have five cells here, for example. 
Another way of asking that question, if I'm wrong, correct me, okay? Another way of asking that question would be, I have this and I have these five cells and I go to the workspace and I clear everything. There is no variables, nothing there. Can I go to the fifth cell and execute it? Does it depend on the execution of the previous cells? Is that the kind of question you're asking? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so the answer to that is you have to be very careful because if there are any variables in this cell that depend on the values in the previous cell, you must have executed that. Okay. For example, <clears throat> In this case, I think it follows um, each one is kind of independent. Uh, no, here, here is a problem. If I come to the second cell and say execute it, it doesn't know what to plot because it doesn't have the temperature value. So it's going to give you an error message <coughs> in the workspace. Undefined variable t. Okay? So it's very important when you're debugging it, structure it in such a way that you execute it in a particular order and go through that. So incrementally developing the program, it's a very, the cell structure is a very useful one. Everything in the cells are global. It's in the workspace. Not global, I shouldn't say global. It's in the workspace. All the variables are defined in the workspace. Okay? You can selectively pass them globally to other functions by declaring them to be global. <coughs> okay, is that that's your question? Okay, any other questions? Really, there are some very, very perceptive questions from a number of people. Okay, that makes me happy, but it also makes me to push things ahead. I don't want to do that. So you need to slow me down. If others are finding it difficult, you need to slow, slow me down. So that completes basically the analysis of that particular problem. Let's go back to what else is there in the... <coughs> Okay, the piece of code is also in the notes. Yeah, the second problem I wanted you to, to look at, so let's take this through what uh, you would be expected in an exam. Here is a problem, okay? <coughs> Van der Poel equation. It's an equation that comes from some circuit design problems as well as chemical reactions also have very similar behavior. It's going to expose us to new type of behavior in the problem. First question to you. <coughs> 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 Excuse me. The first question to you is, what kind of a problem is it? Linear or nonlinear? Lumped or distributed? Steady state or dynamic? None. <coughs> Excellent. Yeah. Nonlinear because there are unknowns are y1 and y2, and we have products y1 square. We have. We have y1 times y2. The first equation is linear because it appears by itself. There is no nonlinearity there. The second equation is the one that is nonlinear. But they are coupled. What do I mean by that? y1 depends on y2 and y2 depends on y1. So each variable influences the other variable. So that makes the problem completely nonlinear. So previous example was linear. This example is a nonlinear. Is it what kind of a problem? Lumped or distributed? Distributed would mean that there would be a <coughs> spatial variation. Okay, this variables y1 and y2 would depend on coordinate positions x, y, z. But it depends only on time. It is a lumped model. So ordinary differential equations of this type are always lumped model. Okay. And we will see a next example where we have an ODE that's a distributed model that will be called a boundary value problem. This one is called an initial value problem because y1 and y2 are given at t equal to 0. So lumped dynamic models that are initial value problems, initial value problems are always solved by ODE 4.5 or ODE 1.5s. There are many tools in MATLAB. Okay. So this one I'm illustrating ODE1S, and I will tell you why. Okay. <clears throat> so that's the very first thing that you need to be able to ex uh, understand in a quiz or an exam. Classify the model so that you can pick the right tool. Okay. You cannot solve this problem with FSOL. You have to use it with a uh, ODE solver. 
Any questions on that? Why it is nonlinear? Why it is lumped? Why it is dynamic? Time, if you have time dependence, it is dynamic. There is no spatial variation, it is lumped. Okay? And it's initial value problem because all the variables are given at t equal to 0. Yeah? Are all models dynamic? No, there are lumped models that are steady state but distributed. That will give you give rise to ordinary differential equations also, and we will see an example of that later on. Okay, that's why it's very important to understand by looking at the model. You should be able to tell this is this is a doctor diagnosing a patient's problem, right? Here you have a problem. You're going to diagnose what kind of a model is it so that I can choose the right tools. Okay, so I don't know whether I have answered your question. Well, we gonna choose between lumped and distributed. <coughs> all, all possible combinations are possible. You can have a lumped dynamic model, a distributed dynamic model, you can have a lumped steady state model, you can have a distributed steady state model. So far we have learned how to recognize a lumped steady state model which results in algebraic equations and lumped dynamic models which results in ordinary differential equations of the initial value type. When I say initial value type, the way you check that, you figure that out is by asking where are the conditions for the ordinary differential equation given. They are all given at t equal to 0. And t typically appears in such equations. t is the time, the independent variable. That means it's a lumped dynamic model. Okay? <coughs> I think we are almost out of time. I will illustrate the solution to this in the next class and then we will move on to uh, other types of model equations.